Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sisterin. I want to say to the Tawahado Bible Study, because it will be re-released there as well, but, you know, the bigger podcast, The Philosophy of Art and Science, which is uh, more everything under the sun in classic Ecclesiastes fashion. But you know the deal. If you support this program, you can join the YouTube channel directly, or you can go to patreon.com slash oxum or oxum.substack.com. Today's special guest is Blaze Webster. Salam alaikum. Alaikum wa salam. Shalom. Shalom. You know, you are really a jack of all trades. I've seen you, at least from what I can tell, being into church, music, film, writing. How is it that you introduce yourself, whether personally or podcastingly? Sure, yeah. I mean, it really... I guess it kind of depends on who I'm talking to, right? <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I've always been interested in a lot of different things, but I think somehow they all relate to each other. Um, but yeah, very, very interested in art, film for sure, music. I'm, I'm a musician. And then I'm also really into history and I'm into culture and I'm into religion and language and all that stuff. It just, just works together. So it, it's kind of like I have one, one interest that has many facets, but it all it all. I like through. that. Yeah. Many parts of Game of Thrones were inappropriate. Well, one of the things that I liked <laughs> from a religion point of view is that they kind of they took religion as a thing seriously, and they examined all the facets of it, and they had a kind of large overplay between what they called the old gods and the new gods of the continent and the world that they're in. But particularly, there was this one god called the Many-Faced God, which was an AKA for death. And um, that was that was kind of his shtick, is that he had many different manifestations, but it was the same um, deity or thing going on. I, I like to think that I have that too, because there is something about me that's a little eclectic, and people definitely see that on my YouTube channel. Yeah, my, yeah. Uh, my good is teacher, actually, <laughs> he wanted to be more church-oriented. He uh he's like what is all this other stuff <laughs> but well, I, I think yeah. that's me yeah i think i think we're very similar in that way I, I really enjoy all of your content your your reviews of different films and things like that different media and then of course obviously your your uh, biblical studies and church stuff so i mean i i feel like feel like you and i man we're we're kind of cut from the same branch or whatever is the expression so yes that's dope so I want to talk about the main thing then, which is the church, but to zoom in from the point of view of scripture, what are your earliest memories of hearing scripture? Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Like I parents, think, grandparents, or yeah. whatever early church community you're part of or school, if you had anything like that. Sure. Sure. Well, yeah, religion was a part of my life from a pretty young age, although it was, I would say not necessarily the most ideal situation. Um, my, my parents weren't together, and so there were two different sides. One side was very Catholic, and the other side, I'll say, was very not Catholic. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, um, it was that it mean like an anti-papist Protestant or just none? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it was weird. It was, it was definitely a little, um, I did a, a, a little bit aggressive towards Catholicism, but also, you know, we didn't go to church on that side very often. And when we did, it would be like a non-denominational, very kind of milk toast kind of experience. So I, I grew up in kind of that odd situation. And then I also went to uh, elementary school at a Quaker school. Oh, no and, way. Um, which I actually loved. That, um, that had a profound impact on me that I can get into later. But um, as far as going to church with uh, the other side, uh, my grandmother on my dad's side is very devoutly Catholic. And I loved going to church with her just to experience, I think, the uh, the beauty of it. The church that she went to was this old church in uh, in uh, rural Kansas that I'm pretty sure it was, it had to have been built before uh, Vatican II. So it still had, you know, that classic, uh, you know, architecture. And, uh, I, you know, I, I thought it was, was really beautiful. And I, and I guess when I grew up, I kind of, I didn't think of Catholicism and Protestantism as really 
two different things. I kind of thought of my grandma's church as like the old school traditional church that took it a little bit more seriously. Yeah. And then, and then the other one was, was kind of uh, something for younger people. That was, that was in my brain as like a little kid, but that's kind of what I experienced. Then of course, you know, I, different family members gave me a Bible and then I went to, um, went to a, a couple of religious summer camps. And I think that one year I was probably seven or eight. And that was the first year where I was at a religious summer camp. And that was the first time I had any sort of, uh, instruction in the bible and that's where you know in the back of my mind i, I got really uh really interested in it because uh, we started talking about doctrine and, and uh, different stories from scripture and so that's kind of when it started and, and then i remember when i was eight or nine i tried to read the bible cover to cover and i didn't get past genesis but it was it was a it was a valiant effort for a for a young boy Genesis but, uh, might be the gravesite of of many many people who I think so. It's it's Bible. pretty it's pretty long and it's it's repetitive and of course uh, being that young I didn't I mean it's not written for kids you know, yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. Le Leviticus might have taken more souls, but I think <laughs> yeah. that is is up there. It's funny you said a number of things there that I relate to. First, yeah. the non biblical examples I can give you is. Um, Nipsey Hussle, whose funeral and funerary rite I got to participate in at the Eritrean Orthodox Tawahado Church. One of the fascinating things I got to learn about him is because his mother is into some strange new age um, philosophies, if you want to call them a religion, a religion or spirituality. His father's a nominal Orthodox. He's really a nominal Orthodox. But I found out shortly after his uh, being killed uh, on that block he was famous on, on Slauson and Crenshaw, his grandmother was a cradle black Catholic, part of these oh, yeah. uh, Creole people that are some of the founding black people of Los Angeles. And the founding priest of Los Angeles was also one of the founders of hip hop, Father Amda Hamilton. He did a nice poem. I had a couple lost recordings with him that should have made it to my channel, but didn't because of technology issues. Uh. But he, uh, before he converted to Ethiopian orthodoxy, um, Father Amda Hamilton of the Watts Prophets was uh, raised by a, a black Catholic uh, grandmother, again, Creole. He, and he told me actually his grandmother didn't even speak English, just spoke Creole. Whereas wow. Nipsey's grandmother, a little, you know, uh, got to think it's a little generational gap. Uh, Father Amda's in his 80s, he's still alive. Nipsey was would have been in his 30s or, or maybe early 40s if he's still alive. So their respective grandparents are going to be of different generations the biblical example obviously is lois and eunice for saint timothy who's later the bishop of ephesus and mm -hmm. of course we have our beloved ephesus school that we'll talk about uh, shortly soon and my own grandmother has played a, a huge role in my life so i i love hearing that from you and and hearing all of these um these different examples the nudge against the historic churches like the catholic church and the orthodox churches that they no scripture less. I know you said you attended it less in the other non-denominational Protestant, but was there, besides this old young dynamic, which I understand, very different than the streets of South LA, I'll tell you, where everyone asks you, are you Christian or are you Catholic? Which is a, a question that bugs me. I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, but, but it, was there a noticeable difference at all, or are you too young to notice in, like, was there a scripture emphasis more or less in one of those traditions? Yeah, I don't think I really noticed it as a little kid because I, I guess because I experienced both. Uh, but when I was growing up, you know, I, I never really thought of going to Catholic Mass as being any less centered around the Bible because, I mean, they, they did a very, very similar thing that they do in Orthodox churches where they do the procession, the entrance with the, with the gospel book. And um, I don't know, I, that, that seemed, you know, it, it, it seemed like the Bible was, was front and center. So, I, yeah, I didn't really think about it in those terms. And especially being that young, I didn't know, you know, anything about doctrine or dogma. Um, you know, that that kind of thing came later when I would ask like pastors about it and, you know, I would get the whole spiel about the uh, Reformation and things like that. But yeah, as a, as a young kid, I, I don't think I really noticed a substantial difference. It was an aesthetic difference, I think. Which again, it's it's kind of that that purity of a child's brain. I think that you don't you don't necessarily overanalyze. You just kind of take in what's in front of you. Um, but yeah, I didn't didn't notice that at, at the time.
Well, th yeah, that's good to hear that you weren't exposed to these endless arguments, which are still going on, by the way, on the internet. I I've been yeah. engaged in sometimes contentious or controversial talks online, but you know, the big thing I picked up from Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, and I've written about it in my own words, is to not debate people, yeah. but to teach those with ears that hear. And uh, that's it, and to do so tirelessly. So um, speaking of them, and since we, we mentioned it, I wonder then if you could talk about what drew you to the Ephesus School Network and then uh, perhaps, you know, Orthodox Christianity writ large. I mean, it doesn't seem like a huge leap from Catholicism, uh, but there is no. a question of why, because some people are comfortable where they are. Yeah, it's uh, so that kind of gets into a, a little bit more of my background, too. So I was never baptized into anything. Oh, so, that's so I, I was I was never baptized Catholic. I, I know my um, my Catholic grandmother, obviously, she she wanted me to be. But again, you know, there was disagreements between the families. And that's again, it's understandable. Uh, so I it, I never belonged really to a church. I would I would go occasionally because, again, my the, grew up with my mom and, and she didn't really go all that much. And, and then when I did, it was with other family or whatever. And then when I went with my grandma on my dad's side, it was just whenever I was around her. So, um, so I was never baptized. And uh, I actually, when I was a teenager, I fell out of religion uh, because basically what I saw online was exactly what you described, just instant fighting and vitriol. And uh, that was when I started learning how to think critically. And I guess, you know, around 2012, your exposure to Christianity is, you know, it's, it's very stock. It's, it's kind of the Ken Ham, you know, Ray Comfort type, you know. So that, that definitely turned me off uh, ar around, around that time when I was a teenager. And I became a bit of a new atheist for a while. Um, but very soon, kind of Sam Harris or yeah, one of yeah, the so, or who, who was that? Yeah, I liked I, I liked uh, Sam Harris. I, I I think I liked um, Bill Maher. It's, it's 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 funny now to to say because I I definitely disagree with this now, but I I definitely liked uh, Richard Dawkins for a while. Mm -hmm. Well, you see what he said of late, haven't you? I know he's I know, now yeah. a, a cultural uh, a cult Christian, yeah, because he's afraid of the rise of Islam. It's yeah, it's a. I have a lot of things I could say about that, but, uh, <laughs> but, but anyways, you know, so I, I went down that rabbit hole and then, um, then it, it really wasn't until I got into college fully that I, uh, I went to another Quaker school, but it was a university this time. And so I, I was kind of forced to take religion classes, but I was confronted with the uh, person of Jesus who I was, mm -hmm. uh, reintroduced to, and I fell in love with the teaching all over again. Uh, but that leap to believing in, in God again, that took a little bit of time. And that's kind of where orthodoxy comes in for me. Yeah, that's uh, actually very similar to me in that yeah. I, I went to a Lutheran middle school. And so that's one of the more high churches within Protestantism, but obviously lower than Catholicism and orthodoxy of the different stripes. And then I went to a Church of Christ affiliation, which is from the revival 1800s movements from uh, Alexander uh, Campbell, which are non-denominational products as they say they say their church started in 33 ad mm -hmm. yeah uh, i mean everybody does right <laughs> <laughs> well I, 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 I mean i mean have have you heard of the the baptist like trail of tears no tell me thing? about that i mean it's uh, just very briefly it's um it's not held by like all baptists but there there, there is a, a line in, in a kind of baptist lore that um the baptist church started at the beginning of christianity and they were persecuted by the Catholic Church all throughout history, you know. And it's 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 this uh, it's this unique line that's not connected with Protestantism or anything like that. Like it's um, obviously obviously wild, you know. Like their examples are people like the uh, the uh, Sabellians, you know, and like different different that's hilarious. Uh, different heretical groups that you know clearly yeah. they haven't really read much about. <laughs> I think they're non-trinitarian. We had we had a Sabellian prime minister of Ethiopia. Uh, really uh, one prime minister ago yeah it was the first non-orthodox even culturally leader now uh, we're on our second who's a part of the prosperity gospel 
So wow, wow, I didn't know that. But interesting. yeah, so were you exposed to then something like the early church or patristics or something? Yeah, in, yeah at so, the Quaker University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so not necessarily in classes. I did have a Christian history class, but I was already getting into it. But anyway, so I, I was into Jesus again, mm -hmm. um, and then so the next kind of option. Again, like I, I didn't know if I believed in God, but like I, I wanted to go to a church just to just to try it out. And so, um, you know, there's there's different angles of this story, but but one of them was trying to figure out, okay, well, I like this Christianity idea. Now I need to know the history of it, you know. And that's when I went through the history um, brand new again, and I uh, I found a book. I can't remember who it was by, unfortunately, but. It'd probably be easy to look up. It comes in two parts. The first part was um, like it was like church history from Christ to the pre-Reformation, big book. And then there was a second one, which was Reformation on. I didn't read the second book, but I read the first book that was up to the Reformation. And he talks a lot in that book about the Eastern churches. And so, you know, that definitely piqued my interest. I had been to Greece a couple of years before in high school. And that was the first time I'd ever seen Orthodoxy. Everett Ferguson, yeah, that's who it was. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a great book for anybody interested in church history. Um, so, you said yeah, you'd been to Greece? I, I'd, I'd been to Greece. Yeah, that was the first time I'd ever seen an Orthodox church. There's, there's actually there's a fun, fun video uh, on my Facebook that you know you can find if you dig deep enough where 15 year old me is doing a vlog in Athens and I'm talking about being excited about visiting an Orthodox church. It's, it's funny to, to watch now. Um, but anyway, so I was aware of it and a friend of mine and I, he was kind of in a similar situation, didn't really know where he stood religiously. So we went and church hopped basically for a few weeks. And then um, the current church that I go to now, the Orthodox church was up, literally up the street from wow. the school. And so I told him, I was like, well, you know, uh, it wouldn't hurt to do something different than what we've been doing. So if, you know, you want a different experience, I think I have an idea. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if it was going to be accessible. I didn't know if it was going to be, you know, in English at all. Um, but we, we went in and it was, uh, everybody was wonderful. Um, people were, were welcoming and I was blown away by the liturgy it, Obviously, you know, it, it wasn't too different than the Catholic one, but, you know, the Byzantine chant, the incense and uh, the art, the icons, everything. I, I'd never seen an Orthodox liturgy. I'd been in a church, but I'd never seen a liturgy. And, yeah, uh, big difference. I, I was transfixed. And then, you know, I met Father Aaron Warwick um, and uh, he gave me his number and he said, you know, if you have any questions, let's go get coffee or something. And I took him up on that. And, uh, you know, became a catechumen and, and the rest kind of fell into place. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And I know about him, about Father Aaron Warwick, and that's St. Mary's Orthodox Church, right? In yeah. Wichita, Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, I know about him because of the Ephesus School Network. I've been on phone calls and Zoom calls with him. I've never met him in person, actually. And so it, it's funny. So w at the time you met him, had he started his podcast yet, Teach Me Thy Statutes? No, no. So I, I met him sometime in uh, 2017 or 2018. And he didn't start that until 2019, right before the pandemic, basically. And so I, I was going kind of uh, off and on for a while when he started that. And, and that was that was my, my entryway, really, into uh, the Ephesus School. That's how I found out about it. So... I loved his podcast, obviously, and then as a catechumen, it was invaluable to, it was, it was weird, it was like providential, it was, you know, the priest starts a podcast where he talks about the Bible and, and how it relates to what we do in church, like right when I start catechesis, it was perfect. Um, so, you know, like I click on the Ephesus School thing, and then that's where I found the Bible's literature, and I found your podcast, because it was around the Tawahedo Bible study, which I thought was cool, you know, because I had known about Ethiopian Orthodoxy just tangentially but i didn't know anything about it so i remember listening to that uh and, and thinking that was cool that that was there um but yeah and and uh so you know i i would ask father aaron all sorts of questions but it was all you know it was all scripture related and um 
I don't know. I like to joke around that I asked him so many questions that he got annoyed and <laughs> and he just said, look into Father Paul Tarazi. Yeah. So which is which is which is interesting. Uh so it's interesting advice to give to a to a catechumen, but I, I think he he saw that it would be up my alley. Um so I uh I read the rise of scripture at as, as as a catechumen. Wow, that was your first introduction. That was my first, which I mean, wow, that's his magnum opus. It, it is, it is, and um, you know, I didn't really understand it at the time, uh, but I there was a lot in there to chew on, and uh, you know, I, I've read it many times since, and it's you know, it's it's one of the greatest books on scripture ever written, obviously, but um, but yeah. Oh, oh there have, it is. Yeah, I have my uh, my copy right here. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I I actually originally listened back in 2016 to the audio lectures yeah. that were gathered together to become that book, and so originally it was a bunch of these audio lectures put together uh, that Father Mark Bulos had released, and then I think that became the print book. And then I think they made an audio book after that, which was like a refined version. So I, I listened to that like early, early cut <laughs> version. Yeah, no, yeah, that's good. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I I read that, and you know, there was a lot of things that that blew my mind. But you know, I think um, the thing that it got me interested in then was the uh, original languages. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I had a couple of conversations with uh, Father Aaron about it, and. Uh, you know, he pointed me to some other, some of Father Paul's other audio stuff. And um, and then that was around the time too that he started doing his podcast, the Tarazi Tuesdays. Um, and then it was from that that I just, you know, I'd, I'd write down all these notes. And so like, I didn't really plan on it, but I was learning Hebrew. Yeah. Listening to his podcast. Just listening. Yeah. See, see, I have to pause you there because I have recommended the Bible is literature and Tarazi Tuesdays, especially to, I want to say scores of people. And of all the people I've ever really recommended it to about three to four of them got back to me and said, they love it. And they're hooked. And then the overwhelming majority, they're like, I didn't get it. And then you just yeah. never listen again. So there's, there's something in you that was patient enough to hear that. So I'm, I'm wondering, cause it, it is so language heavy um and i i want to get to that i have a funny quote about that that will get us into your language stuff but i'm wondering did you have any language background before did you learn french and spanish growing up did you hate either language yeah that's that's the weird thing i feel like i've always been interested in languages like i have a cousin who's a polyglot and i was always <laughs> jealous of that um but yeah i mean you know like i took spanish and stuff but uh you know I, I i could never really get to a fluent level but um so you know i never really thought that learning the biblical languages would be that accessible to me but what made it accessible and you know we can get more into this but what made yeah. it accessible for me was uh father paul's emphasis on functionality mm -hmm. and, and the triliteral roots that to me that that made me get it at a, at a certain level that I wouldn't have if I was just uh, going about it in maybe a more traditional sense where, you know, you have your, your vocab and you learn like what the vocab means. And you, it's, it's a lot, like a lot of memorizing. But um, when I learned about roots and you can get the overall picture of a word in a Semitic language just on those three letters, and from those three, three letters, you have all these different words that all relate to each other. Then instead of, you know, memorizing a bunch of different words, I was memorizing a root and all of its different functions. And that, uh, that worked wonders for me, especially relating to the biblical story, because and then you could use the story and the roots and they would work together. And, and, uh, it just, it fit with my brain and, uh, and that, eventually is what made it accessible to me 
Yeah, that's beautiful. And thank you for explaining the tri uh, the trilateral consonantal roots. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, you mentioned functionality. Obviously, I know what you're saying, but for the sake of our audience, could sure. you talk about that? Because off camera, I told you also about mm -hmm. my own essentialism that I had picked up in studying the classics of Western philosophy, obviously Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, but also the the great thinkers in medieval Europe and to the to the modern day, um, things like William Lane Craig drawing on the cosmological argument from Islamic thought, which is influenced by Plato, people like Thomas Aquinas and Augustine and, and, and Thomas Hobbes and all the thinkers you can imagine. I, I was thoroughly westernized in my undergraduate studies and studying my own Semitic languages of Giz and Amharic and then hearing from uh, the Hebrew and sometimes the Arabic too, the Hebrew up listening to the Bible as literature and Tarazi Tuesdays helped me kind of get rid of some of my essentialism. But what is this functionality you speak of? Because people yeah. talk about like functional fitness, you know, which is kind of related. Sure, sure. <laughs> and yeah, functionality, it's, it's a simple concept, but I find that it can be difficult to explain. Um, you know, it's especially somebody who hasn't, uh, hasn't come across it before. But uh, what I would say is I, I think it was explained best actually by our friend Andrea Backus on um, on her uh, she she did like a four part uh, four part uh, series on functionality in scripture. But basically, on vexed, vexed podcast vexed, uh, on vexed yes on on the vexed podcast. Thank you. Um, yeah, where she used examples where Hebrew doesn't have abstractions in the language, so. Um, you know, the, the word af means nose, but it also means anger because when somebody's angry, their, their nose flares. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's examples like that, but the language is, is filled with those types of examples. Um, you know, and then in, there's, there's little interesting things. So you've, you know, you've got, um, you've got, uh, in, in, in Arabic, the root, uh, kataba, which is KTB. It's the same as in, in Hebrew. Um, in the good, and, as an Amharic. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And, and then an office is a makta. You nice. Know, you, you, you add to nominalize it. Father Paul talks about this to, to nominalize it. You add essentially an M or the, yeah. uh, the, the letter mem in, in Semitic languages. But you add it to the front of the word and, uh, and, and it, it gives it like a place, basically. That's know? beautiful. Um, madrasa comes from uh, uh, darasa, which means to study. You know, DRS and in a, in a madrasa in, in Arabic is a, a school, you know, so it well, things like that, you know, that to me, that's functionality because it, yes. it's not it, it's not a, an abstract. Um, one might say like a platonic in terms of thinking of the ideals. It's not an abstract concept that's outside of reality. You know, it's a it's a very, uh, very down to earth. Uh, it, it is it is how it functions, and that's what it describes in the language. And when I thought about it that way, then I felt like I was really adopting the language on its own terms and not just translating that concept into English. You know, because for us, anger is an idea. It's not it's not a physical thing necessarily inherently, but in Semitic languages, it is. That's right. It's it's abstract versus these concrete things we're pointing to. That KTB root in in Giz, it's a Kitab is a book, but it's particularly the one that we carry our Psalter in. It's like a knapsack oh. we carry our Psalter in usually because we have another Mus'af, which is like writing or or book. Maybe it's scroll originally, and we start using it as as a book. And it's obviously the same as the Hebrew Ketub Ketubim that they changed to the V, the Ketuvim, the third yeah, section, but... the miscellaneous writings of the Hebrew Bible. That uh, Darasa, uh, DRS you spoke of is our Darasi is an author. Darasa yeah, is, yeah, yeah. is someone who, like you said, through studying has has produced some composition or another. So yeah, it's it's amazing. So the quote I have, and it's funny, I heard it on a jujitsu podcast just earlier this week, a, a judo and jujitsu podcast. And they, they actually made two biblical references. The one is my favorite one. It's that uh, Jacob doing submission grappling or wrestling uh -huh, with the yeah, angel, yeah. which represents God. But the second one was from a Hebrew Bible poet. I think he was a 20th century figure, Haim Nahman Bihilak. 
And he says, you may have heard this, reading the Bible in translation is like kissing your new bride through a veil. And yeah, I, and that particularly stuck with me because you've you've looked on your medium, which is good into your writing, at the Greek word for veil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and Second <laughs> so, Corinthians, yeah. So I, yeah. I I'm wondering if you can. Uh, we we jumped into it a bit, but maybe we could uh, categorize this by the by the various languages, and and that will give us some structure. Um, how did you approach the Greek language and what, what were you thinking and in, in trying to study it? So Hebrew, you kind of casually took notes from the podcast. Yeah. What, where did Greek come in, in, in the literature? I don't know exactly what yeah, yeah. So, your parish yeah. was in. So I'm, I'm Antiochian, uh, mm -hmm. which, which again, so the Antiochians, as far as Eastern Orthodoxy goes, is like the place to be if you want to know the Semitic side and the Greek side, you know, like it's, it's very similar, I think to the, uh, to the Coptic Orthodox Church because they do have Greek sometimes in the liturgy. Like when I went to, I went to one in, in uh, the Dallas area not too long ago. And um, anyway, so there's Arabic and Greek and Coptic and, and all sorts of Hellenized stuff going on. Alexandria. Yeah, exactly. I think Father Paul calls it the most Hellenized of all yeah. the cities. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, but uh, so, so the, the uh, Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch, very similar, you know, it's got, it's got that Greek liturgical tradition, obviously it comes from Constantinople. But the local people, they speak Arabic and Aramaic. And, um, and then, you know, since the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, at least, the, uh, the Antiochian Orthodox, you know, is customary to, to just start doing it in the vernacular, which for them was Arabic. So um, when these immigrant communities came over, they brought that with them. And, and so, you know, now, obviously, the liturgy is mostly in English, but there's still parts of the liturgy that we have in different languages. So the Trisagion, we do, um, you know, once in English, once in Arabic and once in Greek, mm -hmm. which, uh, which I love, you know, it, you're, you're getting all the, all the sides. Hagios, 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 Kadush, Kadush, Kadush. Exactly. Like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, yeah, kind of relating it back, I was hearing a lot of Greek in, in the liturgy, but yeah, you know, I would hear like uh, Greek from, uh, Father Aaron's podcast, I'd hear it from the Bible's Literature podcast. But actually, when I was in college, I took a, a, a New Testament Greek class. There you go. Wow. So so, so this was, um, again, it, it's all related because I was into Father Paul at this point. Um, I was listening to the podcast, but I took a Greek class. And, uh, you know, it was a good class. Uh, but definitely my approach to Greek was different. It was more, at the time at least, a, a traditional way of, of studying the language. Um, and so that was helpful for its for its own reasons. But even even Greek, you know, it, it has because of how it's used in the New Testament, it, it retains some of those um, Semiticisms, um, which can be uh, interesting, especially people's names, you know, uh, like 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 Pavlos, you know, it the name's Latin, but it, it means the little one. And that has mm -hmm. significance to his story. And, and uh, you know. There, there were things there were things like that but anyways i i learned greek originally in in school and then i actually took lessons from father paul he was doing a zoom class with a bunch of a uh, bunch of different people um and so i i started taking uh taking those from him as well so again it's it's difficult being um wanting to learn the biblical languages is is difficult because there's so many you know, I mean, it's a, you got to know Greek and you got to know Hebrew. And I think really to, to know Hebrew well, it's 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 not just Hebrew. It really helps to look at other Semitic languages. Um, and then there's also Aramaic, you know, in, in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, it'd be a lot easier if we just had one language, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like Babel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but but no, it's it's fun, though. I, I love it. And um, and it, it definitely helped to retain the Greek going to an Orthodox church. And I, I have uh, a friend actually, who's uh, from Hios, the uh, island in, in Greece. So he's obviously a native Greek speaker. So we've had a bunch of conversations about it. Yeah. Um, and, and the modern being different than the, the Koine or the older, the old Greek uh, yeah. that you'd be studying. I, I'm wondering, um, being an Indo-European language, did 
did Greek come to you more easing, easily having studied Spanish and English, which are at least at face value, even, even though Father Paul says uh, English is a barbarian Germanic tongue, <laughs> as the Greeks and Latins yeah. would have looked at it in, in their time, in the, in the classical period in, in antiquity. Um, and, and he mentioned, I think, in one of his podcast episodes that even the German producers of the Netflix show Barbarians refer to Germanic as a barbarian tongue. So was but but they're all indo-european in, in source sure. yeah was that was that easier to pick up um yes and no uh yeah i don't know if it was easier or harder necessarily like i i think what made what made hebrew a little bit easier for me not that it's easy but it, i i picked it up faster because i was learning it in a fun way i was learning it you know mm -hmm. from from the podcast and and uh from uh the context and the stories and things like that. So that that was a really unique way to learn Greek. You know, it was classroom Books, out of the textbook. Yeah. But you know, I, I would say uh, learning Spanish in uh, in high school helped uh, because uh, the the way the verbs conjugate is very similar. Um, but what Greek Greek really kicked me in the rear, actually, and, and I think this is true with a lot of people who uh, haven't learned languages with uh, case endings, because English doesn't have that, neither does Spanish. But Greek, like German and Russian, I believe, too, has uh, case endings. So, you know, you got like the nominative, the genitive, the accusative, you know, uh, and the dative. And uh, that that was kind of difficult because, um, you know, it basically supplies in, in English when we say like, you know, it, it, it supplies grammatically the uh, direct object and the subject and the indirect object, but it's it's part of the ending of the uh, the word. So you have the the word uh, word would be logos. O logos would be the nominative. If you wanted to say of the word, it would be to logu. If you wanted to say to the word, it would be to logo. And then if you wanted to use it as the uh, the direct object, it would be on logon. That would be the the accusative. So, uh, so this is the thing that um, Jordan Peterson, and he's not alone. Um, you hear even venerable Greek fathers, I'm talking even modern day people, but even the ancients and the patristics, because not all patristics are the same. They'll take that word that you just mentioned for word, logos, mm -hmm. and it's behind logic and all the ologies that we have in the English language. And they'll say, how was it interpreted in Greek philosophy, and that must be what Saint John the Evangelist meant. Um, I'm imagining that's not your approach. <laughs> well, it's 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 complex because different philosophers used it different ways. You know, I mean, if you look at the etymology of the word, I believe originally it meant to uh, pick or to choose, actually, which is which is different than than what we would think. If if the the word for like speaking was apo, or sorry epo epo, uh, which is where we get epic from, because it was like telling nice. a story. And actually, um, have have you learned Greek? No, I haven't. Just so, random words listening to the podcast. So the eris, just to make a long story short, the eris tense is somewhat analogous to like the preterite tense in Spanish, but not really. But anyways, it's like the simple past tense for the most part. But um. There, there isn't that version of in, grammatically for lego, which is the verb form of logos. In, uh, in Greek, it goes straight to uh, ipon, which is actually from epo. Uh, so it's, it's, it's all convoluted. So it, it seems originally that uh, lego didn't necessarily mean to speak. It, it kind of brought, it, it, it got that meaning uh, over time. Um, because you you see it in uh, in other words that survive in Greek like eklego, which means to choose, which is where we get the, uh, the participle eklektos, which is where we get eclectic and eventually elect. Um, so uh, so yeah, so it's it's complicated, but uh, eventually it did mean to speak, and that's where we get um, lego and logos logos. I, I would imagine it, it eventually meant reason and rationality mm -hmm. because uh, human beings are the only creatures that speak. 
and and you can see that in uh, the Greek word for beast, which is alogon, which is without the logos, basically without the the speech, without the reason, and that's that's like the common uh, common word for a beast in uh, in Koine literature. And so, so ha has learning the Greek, do you believe it has it has helped? And would you recommend others your understanding of scripture? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Greek is Greek is definitely important for the New Testament for sure, and uh, and definitely the uh, Septuagint as well. Um, you know, the Septuagint is a, is a it's a major uh, it's it's a big deal basically in, in, in Christian uh, history. But again, you can't forget about the Hebrew. Uh, and again, that's not us saying that. It's uh, the Book of Sirach, the the, the prologue. Uh, the Septuagint would... itself interpreting itself. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would recommend. I mean, I'm sure people that have watched your your show before are, are probably aware because I've heard you, I've heard you bring it up before. But um, you know, basically, I, I would recommend anybody to go check that out. Uh, you know, if you're Catholic, get out that that Bible and, and and go to Sirach and and read the intro. If not, just look it up online. And uh, you know, it basically says that. Um, the original work was in Hebrew, and when you translate it into any language, including Greek, it doesn't retain the same exact meaning. And it's it's a bit of a warning, really. Um, so uh, so you need the whole package, really. And that's um, that's something that I'm very grateful that Father Paul has uh, has given all of us his uh, his students. You know, that's right. So that takes us back to to Hebrew. How how has learning Hebrew helped out your your study of scripture and and especially visualizing the consonants as our teachers yes. say? Yeah, I mean, there's there's just there's so much to go into and in, in such a <laughs> such a you know like like one one uh, interview. I mean, it's it's yeah because you're talking about the consonantal test. That's <laughs> a whole other thing because when people learn Hebrew, they learn the vowels and yeah. the language didn't have vowels and it's a big it's a big thing, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, it paints your, your takeaway from, from scripture. Definitely. I mean, you know, father Paul used to joke around about the name Isaac and the name Jacob, um, yes. you know, J J Jacob, especially, you know, Jacob, it, it, uh, essentially means like the heel grabber, mm -hmm. you know? And that's a technique in jujitsu. It's called it the is. heel heel hook yeah it is yeah I've, I've heard you say that israel is one who does judo with god yeah that's a funny one that's right yeah that's the translation of israel uh, yes the, exactly the, yeah the contending the wrestling which is really submission grappling is what he did is wrestle until someone says uncle or in his case uh, until they get the blessing yeah. Uh, but yeah even jacob the heel hook is a it's a it's a literal technique that is it's pretty old too yes yes definitely um, but, but anyway, so, you know, like when you're just reading an English Bible and you just come across the name Jacob, it doesn't really mean much to you. It's just mm -hmm. the character. But if you know Hebrew and every time you see that name, you see the heel grabber, that's mm -hmm. going to paint your takeaway from the story. That's going to paint how you see the character. And, uh, that's true for all, every character in the Bible, their names mean something. And that. Once you go down that rabbit hole, it's very fascinating and it's very fun and it's very enlightening. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's really what what Hebrew has done for me. I mean it it it's, uh, it opens the door to the text in in, in a way that um, you know it, it wouldn't have been necessarily accessible without it because you're you're relying on other people's interpretation. And you know, of course, you know you can definitely go overboard with um with word study you know i mean you have to be careful of things like the word concept fallacy and things like that you know if you're if you're doing you know serious study but as as a way to to start out you know i mean one one way to to, to really see what i mean is just to take any book of the bible and go to bible hub or something and, and look up what each character's name is and and see if it relates to the story and i and i will bet you that it does you know a, a lot of times in, in the bible itself it'll say so and so was named because and it'll use the same root where their name comes from you know so yes i was just for an article i was editing looking up again the story from genesis 28 
of Jacob's dream and the latter, because there's a Chrys John Chrysostom quote about how the liturgy is a sacred bridge and it's a living ladder of divine ascent. And so I was getting again, this imagery, which we have in our Marian praise as well, that describes the incarnation as this ladder. And uh, so I was going back to Jacob's ladder because you see it in John 1 51, and that is referencing Genesis 28 verses 10 to the end. And when you look the way you see Bethel, and then he names it the house of God, which is what Beit El means. Mm -hmm. And and you know that because of Hebrew, but you also know that because of Arabic. And then mm -hmm. the the people in the Horn of Africa know that because of Giz and Amharic and Tigrinya. Beit is their, their language as well. But I was actually just looking up to further your point. For example, James, which I harped on and in my Tawahado Bible study, yes. I, just, I just called it Jacob instead of calling it James. I just said Jacob 1, Jacob 2, and so on and so forth. I looked up the Greek. This is what I do because I can't read Greek is I look up like the Mount's reverse interlinear New Testament on Bible Gateway. And it says Jacobos, which it looks a lot more like Jacob, uh, to, to your point. And so even in the New Testament, there's like you said the semeticisms that are it's kind of like the way uh uh some toppings at papa john's are under the cheese for <laughs> the, sure yeah, yeah. Is under the greek there james is not in the bible there is no james it's it's Jacobos, which is the same name as the old testament that's right yeah um yeah i mean it's it's uh i mean i i think about it with like really common examples too um you know the the angel tells joseph that Christ is going to be named Jesus. He doesn't mm -hmm. just tell him that because it's a nice name. He tells him that because Yehoshua in, in Hebrew means Yahweh will save. And he Amen. says he, he's named this because he's, he's going to save his people. Exactly. You know, in the gospel of Matthew chapter one. Yeah. Yeah. People would miss that if they, if they were only studying the Greek. Yeah. Well, it, especially to too, I mean, I mean, if, if the English Bibles had Joshua, it would make a little bit more sense because Joshua led his people into the promised land. So you'd have that narrative story. Yeah. But again, in English, Joshua and Jesus are different names, but in Greek it's Isus for both Joshua yeah. and Jesus. And there are mistakes in the Amharic Bible too, which is mediated by Greek and Syriac and Hebrew at various points. Because for example, um, Father Paul preached on the two Henoks. <laughs> I was cracking up because he was pronouncing it the way mine was, uh, mm -hmm. instead of saying like the anglicized Enoch or Enoch. But um, the first one, the Amharic Bible, the son of Cain renders as Heno and changes the K to an H, which uh, is not in the Hebrew. And they do that, to, I think, I have to say, I don't know for sure, as a scribal thing to differentiate because they want to preserve the blessed Henok, the son of Jared who ends up being the good one, but there, there's a functional Henoch and a non-functional. The son of Cain is not functional. He names a city after himself, which is why I was always careful not to name my podcast after myself <laughs> <laughs> to follow in those footsteps. The temptation is there. And Absolutely. some of the most popular ones uh, follow in, in those footsteps. But you spoke about how you have these communities. I'm imagining they're Palestinian and Lebanese and Syrians. I don't know if they come from any other countries as well. Um, Arabic speakers, but so the Arabic was was kind of in the air around you as well. But then you decided to to pick it up and and even write about it. One of the things I saw you writing about, which I really like, it seeped into the kind of internet culture via London and Toronto by all of the the Muslims of so many different backgrounds who come, and it's this word, Dean. And you mentioned mm -hmm. that it's it's connected to Daniel. My own grandfather's name, whose book I'm resurrecting in the digital age, his name is Daniel. It's a common guy's name, for example, which means judge him. We also have Danyacho, judge them. A uh, girl's name, Danait, which is like a, a girl, a female judge. And so it's, it, was, it was interesting. I, I knew it to be religion. I didn't realize it, it was tied to judgment until I read your writing. Could you talk a little bit about Dean? I remember one funny viral video where a man said, yeah, my Dean, I'm on a mad thing. <laughs> okay oh yeah yeah it's um yeah i mean it's the same root in uh in, in hebrew and in arabic now in hebrew you know it doesn't as, as far as i can tell it doesn't necessarily have the connotation of religion like it does in, in arabic um but uh i i would imagine it, it has something to do and this is what i wrote about that it that it has something to do with uh religion 
giving you uh, some some kind of uh, some kind of code, some kind of uh, thing that binds you to it. Which again, this this kind of in a roundabout way related to English, the word religion comes from a Latin root meaning to bind. So it's it's um it's it's as if a, a judgment has occurred, and in kind of like in court, when the judge rules, then you're obligated. You have an obligation to uh, to follow through on whatever the judge has has ruled, and that's that plays into this Semitic idea of really what religion is. It's it's uh, an obligation to God based on something that some sort of ruling, some sort of judgment that God has given to you. And so that's that's how I that's how I see it. But I mean you can see it in um in uh Arabic and in Hebrew and in, in kind of ways that goes beyond just judgment. You can see it as kind of like administrative. So the the word in Arabic for city is Medina. You know, it's it's it goes back to what we were talking about earlier that if you nominalize a verb you add the m in front of it well the city medina is that root dean with an m in front of it because it's 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 the word for city it's it's uh, like an administrative center that's where the religion is that's where the ruling elite is that's where that's where all of that happens you know and and it's it's of course it's related to uh the biblical uh name midian as well it's it's related so um yeah that's that no that's, that's really basically good. It, yeah it's yeah. it's really good because you remind me of two different lukean passages as you're speaking one is this obligation duty um that the the real servant of god says that i, I have just an unworthy slave or bond servant who's doing his duty the other is the way in which you pestered Father Aaron Warwick with questions. It's like uh, even if an unjust person is pestering you, then you're going to give them the kind of resources that you want. And how much more would God grant you of his Holy Ghost if you just pester him all day and struggle with him and, and contend with him? Another amazing Arabic word that you went into is another Amharic cognate that we use. Maybe it's a loan word. I don't know. It's hard to tell sometimes. Sometimes there are loan words between the two, and sometimes they just have um, the same proto-Semitic root. But it's it's mizan, which any Amharic speaker immediately oh, understands. Oh, yeah. Scale. Yeah, the, the, the scales. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that one. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I have a, a, a lot to go into on that one, but it, it's, it's very powerfully used in, um, in Surah 55 of the Quran. Which I've also been looking into because again, it's it's a gold mine of Semitic roots, and it, it's interesting to see where it uh, aligns with with the Hebrew Bible, uh, just just on a linguistic level. Um, yes, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it's um, I don't I, I don't I don't know if it if it has a direct uh, connection to Hebrew because that can be tricky because the way that Hebrew and uh, Arabic transliterates into each other can be kind of uh, misleading and, and it can be kind of tricky um, partially because Arabic has more letters than than Hebrew and so sometimes um, you know basically Hebrew like a Hebrew letter could be the parent letter of multiple Arabic letters and so it'll usually be in one of those but it, it sometimes it's hard to tell that's which one unless you do a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, uh, work into it, but yeah, it's it's really powerful. It's 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 powerful in that in that surah. I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about that root, since since it's yeah, in, in um, Mark as well. We we use it for scales of justice, but also yeah. for basic scales that you would find in the marketplace as well. Um, well, that's there, that's that's how it's used in that surah. It's, in that yeah, okay, yeah. so that yeah, that's very similar. Um, what I would say when you're speaking on the Quran, I've never given it a serious study and it deserves it, but I I do pick up and I do listen to people who who make these explanations, especially just from uh, more, you know, obviously, um, I don't respect it as much, you know, theologically, but sure, lingu yeah. linguistically, uh, I am interested in how these interplay. Like, I think I've mentioned this before, but 
my wife was watching this show from Dubai, and this is, gets into the dialect uh, versus the kind of modern standard versus the the Quranic might be closer to the modern standard, but older. Um, they were speaking casually and they used the word manafik. And I, I was like doing something else and I turned around because in, in my language, in Giz, manafik means apostate or heretic. But so then I paused it. I had a rewind. I, I was like, I wanted to make sure I heard it right. And then I looked it up. It was clear as crystal. And I found out that it was a loan word to Arabic, to the Quran from Giz. Mm -hmm. But then, it, you know, it changes over time and in the dialect and the way that you're saying. So functionally for them and the way they were using it in this reality TV show is that it would mean hypocrite. And you could kind of see how hypocrite is related to heretic or apostate. It's a little... Um, uh, it's a little different, but then even the opening of the Quran uh, in the name of God, the most uh, you know benevolent and merciful. You you often hear what you miss, for example, in the English versus the Arabic, is that it's Bismillah Rahman Rahim. The mm -hmm. Rahman and the Arahim is this R H M root, mm -hmm. which uh, dyslexically or not, they write right to left, we write left to right. For us, it's M H R, which is mercy bringing it back to biblical Aramaic. I have a cousin, for example, because we picked these biblical names, and her name is Ruhama, which is Aramaic. And it means the same thing if you want benevolent or merciful. It's really it's really the the mercy. And I think it's the mercy that, that comes um, on high. And on that Aramaic note, I think you spoke about this a little earlier, but I imagine originally at some point, Maybe there was always Greek in the Greek church of Antioch, but I I would assume that because even the Georgians have some Aramaic. I've seen them do like the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic before. Do you know of anything of there being, especially with you being a music man, is, is there anything of an Aramaic uh, music tradition? Because and, and I'm just wondering how it yeah. shifts because one of the struggles of the Ethiopian church right now with sacred music is that a lot of the tones were toned in the Giz language. And some people have done have had some success converting some things into Amharic, but even then it's a little clunky. To do it in English, people find that it's very clunky, but there are some people trying. I was a kind of pioneer, but I'm not a music man, and so it's a little silly on me, but people much more musically gifted have been have been trying more. I wonder when you hear the the Greek and the Arabic, whether you understand it fully or not, kind of with your music ear, was that at all a translation of the Aramaic? And then how is that in, in English? Like, is, is it off in English or, mm. you know? Because some people that, say in, in, in Ethiopian churches, we should just read things monotonely in English, as opposed to trying to uh, use this sacred music. And then if you try to create your own tone, it becomes a taboo because they're like, who are you? You're not a saint. You can't just <laughs> make up your own tones. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, there there was, I mean, obviously there was there was Aramaic originally in, in Antioch. That was the language, uh, but of course, you know, my my lineage it comes from uh, the uh, the Byzantine side of Antioch. You know, they there was that schism in the in the sixth century um, between the uh, the Miaphysites and the Chalcedonians, and so I, I think like like really. Aramaic was preserved more so by the uh, Syriac Orthodox and and the uh, uh, and the uh, Aramites. Aramites as well. Yes, the uh, the Chalcedonian Antiochians Greek was their liturgical language, so that's what got preserved. And then they got Arabicized when when the Muslims came in, and so uh, so really, you know, over time, Arabic became the uh, the spoken language. And there's a lot of history that goes into that. It's complicated. But uh, but yeah, as as far as the the music, I'm I'm not I'm not too sure. I, I think I think that would be something interesting to look into. I do know yeah. that, that that there are weird things in our English translations though that that feel like uh, semeticisms. That I don't know if it's coincidental or if it happens in other places. I, I'd be interested to know. Like your your, uh, I'd imagine most of your service is in. Yeah, is an Amharic, right? Yeah, most of it, yeah. it's sung in Giz, and then the readings are read in Amharic. Okay. Um, occasionally, you'll have the readings in English, okay. depending on where you go. So we we recite the uh, the Nicene Creed in English, but when we uh, talk about Christ being before all ages in our 
particular translation of it we say before all worlds which reminds mm -hmm. me of olam yes and, uh, that and, that's exactly and, our word alam. we say yeah. Alam yeah. So, yeah so 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 that's that's something yeah. that, that kind of clues me in that like maybe it's translating because I, I think it's only something i hear that i've heard so far it could be in other places but it's the it, i've only heard it so far in the antiochian archdiocese because we, we have a greek church in town and they say worlds but we say ages i think i think it has something to do with that is that, there any uh, music difference between like the greeks of under the ecumenical patriarch and the greeks of antioch like it i don't know if what i'm hearing is is it just the arabic language with greek music sure. or if they had changed the tones at all it depends on the church really um but of course you know the greeks have their own byzantine style the uh, the antiochians were under the care of the uh the russians for a long time and so i i, I think um we inherited a bit more of a slavonic flavor to our music so it's a little bit different in that sense but it it, it totally depends on who's in charge of the chanting you know it's the, I think uh, St. George Cathedral, which is the, the cathedral here in, in, uh, in Wichita, Kansas, um, I think their chanters are more of the Byzantine persuasion. But I, again, I'm not, I'm not super knowledgeable on, on Byzantine yeah. music like, like, no like, like, like one, one would think given my yeah. interests, but, um, but uh, yeah. No, you're still relatively new in that tradition. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, we'll check back with you in, in five to ten years <laughs> yeah. when you're the choir master. Well, you know, but, yeah, yeah, one of these days when I start chanting. But yeah, it, it totally, it totally just depends. Yeah, um, yeah. I I think on that Russian note, I didn't know. I think I've seen you write Vlasios as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar. Is is that your given name or baptismal name? And is it is it Slavonic or Greek or? So okay, so yeah, so I was born. My my birth name is Blaze. Uh, wow yes yes it's a saint too yeah saint, saint blaze yeah so blaze is the uh is the french version of it mm -hmm. uh but the original is actually latin i believe and it's blasius and then in uh in greek it was blasius which is where that that comes from and then you know in, in different uh different kind of slavonic versions of it i think is Vlasi and things like that but uh, that's oh, yeah. wonderful. <clears throat> yeah, when I when I travel to different orthodox orthodox churches, I, I usually when I go up uh, and, and say my communion name, I, I tell them Vlasios because I feel like if I said Blaze, Saint <laughs> Saint, Bla Saint Blaze isn't that big of a saint, so they might, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, it, I just I, I don't want any confusion there, you know. So I, I have a very humorous uh, father confessor, Abba Thomas uh, Finley, white American from Kansas, actually, of uh, Scots Irish heritage. People tell me, "Oh, I know a Finley." I'm like, "I wonder if he's related." <laughs> I hear that all the time, even uh, the Riverside community. But he uh, he and I used to eat at a pizza joint in I don't know if it's it's franchise. I, it's in Los Angeles. I don't know if it's elsewhere. It's called Blaze, and he would look at me yeah, sometimes and say, "Hey, do you want a Blaze?" <laughs> by which you meant going to the pizza place <laughs> dude i cannot tell you how many times i have had 420 jokes directed my way i mean it's it's non-stop yeah uh, with the and you say no it's just a homophone <laughs> I, I i remember i i learned about that joke be, because somebody made it to me when i was 13 14 and i didn't know what it meant and then it was explained to me so i actually i learned about that joke based on somebody <laughs> making it to me yeah, and um, this past Sunday, it was really beautiful. Actually, it was two Sundays ago, because this past Sunday for us was the halfway point of the fast. Mm -hmm. We call it the Brezet, which is Mount Olives. But the week before was dedicated to St. Gregory of Palamas. But Father Josiah Trenum in his homily of the day, as I mentioned on my blog, he said, actually, they stole this, and it should be renamed after the saint they stole it from, which is St. Polycarp, right? the uh, oh. disciple of the Apostle John. Yeah, so he said it should be the Sunday of of Polycarp. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah. But on that day, he his homily focused, and it stuck with me since on the idea of of Christian friendship. And I think about it in your life because all the things you told me, and even the podcasting that we mentioned, you entered this podcasting world, and you weren't 
alone you did it with uh, your friend with rowdy mm -hmm. so tell me about uh tell me the story and and the christian friendship you had with rowdy to be able to collaborate on this project yeah yeah uh you know we've been friends for a long time we've known each other since we were both in middle school so you know we've wow we've had, yeah we, we we have a beautiful friendship and and uh yeah he's, he's a great guy um but anyway the inception of that podcast just came out of i think a, a lot of reasons why podcasts get started because we were having great conversations and he was um he was newly uh baptized not not into orthodoxy but just uh just kind of non-denominational protestant and um so we had a bunch of conversations and i introduced father paul's work to him and he really connected with it and he started learning hebrew as well and so amazing we, yeah we had all these you know, he he was like, yeah, we should start a podcast, and you know, I wanted to wait for, for a while, you know, before we had, you know, something substantial <laughs> to to say. Um, but yeah, like a year later, we figured, you know, we we uh, know enough at least to to handle, you know, a, a read through of Genesis, you know, and so that's that's what we uh, we ended up going for, and you know, it was very. You know that, that, was, that was around the time that that Father Paul was doing his audio uh, podcast on uh, on Genesis, and so it was obviously very inspired by that. Um, but uh, you know, we, we were also trying to do our own work too. We didn't want to just regurgitate everything, um, which is which is a good thing. It is good to regurgitate uh, good teaching, but you know, we we wanted to actually uh, you know research things ourselves, and and so it was it was basically a the, the way I I branded it and the way that I presented it on the podcast was like, we're not experts and we're not trying to be experts. So take everything we say with a grain of salt. These are two guys that are learning and I'm just recording our study together so that if you want to join in the learning process, then you can be that, that third proverbial person. But it was strictly just you know it was it was a bible study between two people who weren't experts but that were that were uh learning and and uh really trying to uh to uh uncover you know the text and uh and so it it, it was it was really really wonderful and and and, and i learned a lot and uh you know it, eventually we both got super busy and it was it was hard to to continue it on a consistent basis and keep the quality up so um you know since then that's when i've been doing uh mostly written things because it, it's easier to manage it's 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 easier than than having to do a whole production and make sure the audio is good and then edit it and everything you know i was already writing scripts i, I might as well just just write um and uh and that way too, you know, like people can kind of read it on their own time and you know, they can read it on their own pace or, you know, whatever. So it, so it's, uh, it's been, uh, it's been nice doing those, those, uh, studies and still learning and learning from father Paul, uh, monthly. And it's just great. It's, it's, it's a great, it's a great, uh, time in my life of, of learning and, and, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, I'm sure he's stressed to you as he's stressed to me that he respects these ephemeral one-off writings, whether they view or viewed by us as short or long form, but he really gives this admiration to the book, to a book. Have you ever thought mm -hmm. of writing a book? If you wrote a book, um, which book of the Bible would it be about? I know, yeah. Think, would it be a motif type thing? <laughs> yeah, I've thought about that. Um, yeah, Father Paul, he, he brings that up to me quite a lot. You know, the, 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 <laughs> thing, the thing is, you know, like I, I need to have, you know, I, I need to be ready for a book, you know what I mean? And, I know what you mean. And, um, you know, as, as, as we can learn from our Lord, you know, the right time is everything, you know? Uh, so everything has to be according to a to a, a certain time, and I just don't think for me right now it's necessarily time for a book. But that's what these articles are uh, are working towards, you know. I'm, 
Amen. And I again, I know this because of the Bible is literature, not because I know Greek, but that's the difference between chronos, from which we get chronology, mm -hmm. and the kairos, which is that that exactly. opportune moment or that right time. And exactly. uh, I, I feel similarly. Uh, all my Greek has pretty much been from hearing and from the Mount's interlinear uh, testament. So let, let's plug properly as, as we close here. Tell me the yeah. story. Where can it be found? And do you want people to go based off of what I said, Kronos this time? It's the, yeah. it's the Kairos for, for Kronos. Do you want them to go chronologically from episode one? Or where would you oh. start them off? So where can they find the oh, podcast? Goodness. And where where would you tell them to start? Oh, man. I mean... Yeah, you can start at the beginning if you want. I mean, we, it's, I don't know how the quality is at the very beginning because it's, it's very, we were just starting. But um, I would say like my favorite episode we ever did was um, The Ark is Not a Boat. So I'd say like, like if you want an episode that I'm really, really proud of, it'd be that one. Or maybe um, Yes, You Are Your Brother's Keeper was, was, a, was a good one as well. So I would say, you know, if, if you want my recommendation, it would be those. But yeah, you can find it on Spotify. Um, probably the easiest way, honestly, would just be to uh, to uh, look up the Ephesus School online, and then you can find all the podcasts, including ours. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes, that's EphesusSchool.org. Um, yeah. I wonder if you could say anything more about the uh, ARC uh, as we do close out, and then we'll plug the, oh. the blog. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing I do remember in, in studying that podcast, uh, passage i don't know if it's the same thing and it blew my mind when father paul showed this and i went and i always verify he and he says it trust but verify you don't need to have all the same conclusions as long as you have the same methodology which is sticking to the text finding the original languages and doing your own research and that is that the whatever you call it boat in which and this is not by the way true in the giz and amharic and i looked this up but it's true in the hebrew which is important because even other semitic languages are going to be uh, deficient and that's particularly because it's mediated by things like greek um maybe one day it'll be my duty to <laughs> get something direct from hebrew to giz and it'll make more sense but do it man <laughs> <laughs> the boat that moses is sent on mm -hmm. uh to avoid uh, the infanticide of that time, which is obviously a parallel to the infanticide during the baby Jesus's time. That word, the Hebrew word for the boat that Moses is in, is the same Hebrew word as as yes. the ark that and what's, Noah what's, is in. What's misleading is that it's a different word than the ark of the covenant. Exactly, but it's, but it's the same word in in English. Exactly, which is so confusing, and it's like that. That's an example <laughs> where the English makes a connection between the two that isn't there. And, and so you have to be careful, but yeah, uh, yeah, th that's a good point. And, um, yeah. And, in uh, the, the Moses example, it's often translated as a basket, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is, uh, part of what that word seems to mean. So what Rowdy and I did, and actually, I think he was the one that, that really, uh, came up with this idea, which, which I really liked. And I, I, I never heard it anywhere. So again, like with everything, like don't don't just take this as gospel. But it, it, it's interesting that uh, it says in um, in the passage that it was made out of gopher wood. And we were trying to look up, like, what the heck is gopher wood? You know, and, and he, he's a wood guy, and so I figured, you know, like <laughs> he would know. Um, so we we looked online, and uh, you know, there are different etymologies, but there was one that connected it to um, this. Uh, I can't remember if it was Akkadian or something, uh, but they, they connected it to like reeds, um, reeds uh, that, that are along the, uh, the Red Sea and, and things like that. And that's, for one, that connects it with the Moses story because he's found among the reeds, so that's interesting. Um, but also in, uh, in Iraq, there's this type of raft basically and they're made out of reeds and they're they're like baskets on the water and they're called kufas and uh you know if if, if you've done languages for a while you know that like k's and g's like they, mm -hmm. they can often you know kind of inter interrelate so we thought what if there's a connection between gopher and kufa and and it's it, it's it's right there in 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 a rock like, like along the tigris and euphrates people use these basket like rafts and and uh we were wondering, you know, maybe that's that's somehow related 
to uh, to what's going on with the uh, the ark that that Noah built. Maybe it's not necessarily built out of wood. Maybe it's built out of these um, these reeds, you know, and and, and the the whole uh, the whole gopher wood thing. It's kind of a weird translation thing. Again, it's 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 something that you know we we didn't develop super in depth, but it's it's interesting and it's something to uh, to think about. And it's it's an interesting connection with something that that still occurs in the the Middle East. So yeah, it's a concrete example. So thank it like shukran for that concrete example. Ah, and fun. They, yeah, <laughs> the QG thing is is big. The quick two examples I'll give for people: the universal one would be Gaddafi, Gaddafi, and then the Ethiopian specific one is the the mountaintop fortress which the British raided on their expedition that eventually led to the death of our emperor Theodore. It's Magdala in some texts and Magdala. So mm -hmm. it's the, the QG is, it's a very common consonantal shift phenomenon. And that's episode 13 of Tell Me the Story. The Ark is, is not a boat that you can find at ephesusschool.org or Spotify or wherever you find podcasts. You also have uh, the blog, is Medium the main place where that is? And how yes. do they find you on Medium? Yeah, um, I, I believe you could just, type in my first and last name, Blaze Webster. Um, or uh, you could type in Web Productions 28. I think that'll that'll take you there too. Um, but yeah, so that's that's my Medium page. I, I would also like to, to plug a, a friend of mine who's a recent, uh, recent uh, contributor to the Ephesus School, um, Mary from Mary Read Scripture. Highly recommend she does amazing work. And I, I just, I, I wanted to make sure I, I got her and Shout out to Mary. Yeah. I I mm -hmm. think I came across her algorithmically on Instagram because of you. Yeah. And okay. found out. Yeah. yeah. Mary reads scripture. Yeah. Well, she's, I, I've been learning from there too. Yeah, she's she's done amazing things with Greek and Romans that uh yeah, it's 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 amazing work. So um I've I've learned a lot from her. And so I would I would direct people there as well. Thank you. And so now that we plug properly, any any uh closing remarks or ending words of encouragement for those uh, ready to study scripture, but maybe just afraid to, or not knowing how to tackle these, these languages. Uh, it's, it's really tough because I feel like the, the way I learned or I, I am learning is, is, is really unique, but I, I, I do actually, I do have a post that's uh, how to learn ancient languages on medium. So for more detail, you could, you could look into that. Um, and, and I, I go through it step by step, but really like, and I think a lot of people will say this, I think the main thing is to find a text that you like and go straight to the text, start learning, you know, even if it has to be word for word, just, just start, start interacting with the text as soon as you can, because if you just start with the, what's called the grammar translation method oftentimes people get burnt out and if, if you have like an adhd brain like me like it, it's it's easy for that not to be very exciting so um so I, I would recommend just going straight straight to the text and then um and then my, my post has more more detail that uh that uh, I, I hope would be helpful to anybody wanting to get into this stuff i i very much recommend it though because it's as as you know it's it's very um it's very rewarding and it's it's uh especially the the stuff that that you do with with get is it's it's important because you're preserving something and uh i think the semitic side of theological studies does not get enough representation so it's 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 great that that you're doing what you're doing and uh anyways yeah that's that's what i would say <laughs>